My little brother's friends have been camped out at our place for two days straight. Three. It's because of the Xfinity 10G network. Internet that can handle a house full of screens at once, with like basically no interruptions. And it's only getting faster. When I was their age, internet like this was a pipe dream. You sound like my grandpa. Please go home. Introducing the next generation 10G network, only from Xfinity. Restrictions apply, not available in all areas. Your challenge, if you choose to accept it, is this. Let's go, let's go! Show up on day one, work out with us for 30 minutes, feel good right away. Yo! Repeat five days a week for three weeks. Three weeks? Five workouts a week. We're body, and we call that a body block. You pick the block, and you're going to love the experience. On week four, this part is really important. Take the week off. Seriously, we mean it. Rest, go on vacation, or try something new. Maybe some yoga. Notice you're not holding on to any tension here. Or a dance class. Get sexy with it, daddy. You do you. And then start again. Be committed to this process. Choose a new body block each month. Get a new challenge each month. Have fun every day. Avoid burnout. You're not going to quit on yourself today. This is how you reach your goals. You win? There is nothing that we can't do if we work together. Sign up for your first body block today. Visit body.com for a free trial. That's B O D I. Are you ready to get started? Welcome to 80s TV Ladies, part of the Weirding Way Media Network. 80s TV Ladies, so sexy and so pretty. 80s TV Ladies, in and out and through the city. 80s TV Ladies, I've been treated kind of working hard for the money in a man's world. 80s TV Ladies. I'm your producer, Melissa Roth. Looking back at female-driven television shows from the 1980s with your hosts, Sharon Johnson and Susan Lambert-Haddam. Hello, I'm Susan. And I'm Sharon. Our guests today found us and invited us on their show. They are the hosts of Rainbow Remix Podcast. Podcaster Denise Warner and South Florida singer J.D. Danner have a show which covers LGBTQ lifestyle news, music, arts, media, mixology, and more. And for Pride Month, we decided to take a deeper look at queer representation in television, particularly 80s TV. We got to sit down last episode with videographer and podcaster and author Matt Baum to start our conversation about queer TV history. And we decided to wrap it up with J.D. and Denise. It's so great to have you guys here. Welcome. We're so delighted to have you with us. Yeah, we're happy to be here. So happy to be here. Uh, And thank you for having us on your show and reaching out. We now wanted to have you on 80s TV Ladies so that we could talk (laughs) more about 80s television, about you guys, and about queer representation on the the TV tube. Back in the 80s. Back in the 80s. <laughs> and beyond. I was so interested in the topic when we had you guys on the show. You know, it was just something that we never really delved into, you know, or thought much about, you know. So it was really like the fact it was thought provoking. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into this a little bit more. And I, and I really went all in. And was researching all the shows of the 80s and what kind of uh, storylines, you know, ever touched on, you know, gay, lesbian, queer, trans. And it was so interesting. <laughs> it was like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Were there any themes or anything that stuck out to you just sort of in a general sense as you were going through the list? You know, I saw kind of like a timeline in my head. Mm-hmm. And in the early 80s, it was more about pointing out, you know, a gay character or the main lead um, pretending to be gay for like Three's Company, right? Like Mm -hmm. Jack pretending to be gay, like to, you know, riff on Mr. Roper and all that. And then, you know, you had other shows that it seemed like that was a thing. Like there was a, a Cheers episode where Norm pretended to be gay to get an interior decorator job for some, you know, and and it was, you know, that kind of stuff. And of course, everybody was flamboyant and it was funny because it was sitcoms, you know. And and then I saw this like trend where the dramas were were picking up on it. Like I, I never knew this and I was a huge Miami Vice fan, but Miami Vice had like two or three episodes that had a gay character in it. But it was one where an old colleague of Sonny's either outed someone or 
you know, had some kind of like, uh, you know, hate slurs towards um, uh, some one of his, his colleague's sons. And and he was really bitter about it. And Tubbs kept trying to figure out why he didn't get along with this with this colleague that they were working with. And uh-huh. he went back and, and explained it. And, you know, it was it was it felt deep, you know, and I was like, OK, here we go. And then I did a little bit more and I noticed that like other dramas started, you know, taking on, you know, some some queer representation as far as like a gay character goes and then protecting that person. Right. You know, right. Like that. Then the trend went to like all the hospital shows that were picking up steam like St. Elsewhere. And, you know, there was um Trapper John. Yes. And they and it was and AIDS came into the picture. Right. And it was a lot more about, you know, the AIDS and the lack of funding and research and characters dying. And, you know, and I was like, well, isn't this uh, like uh, an interesting trend, you know, where it started as being funny and, and flamboyant and, you know, all out for the laughs and stuff. And then it got a little darker, you know, where you, you know, closeted uh, characters were outed. And then it went to the heaviness of, of the AIDS epidemic. So it was really, really interesting. And I was surprised at some of the shows like hotel, like that just didn't feel like a heavy drama back then to have these, you know, big gay storylines on it. You know, I was all about like love boat and golden girls and, you know, stuff yeah. like that. And then I'm like <laughs> reading more and more. And I was like, Whoa. Okay. Interesting. And then um, another one that popped up that was pretty, you know, like I had to like read up on it a little bit was um, L.A. Law. L.A. Law was one of the, the first ones, you know, wasn't that towards the end of the 80s? Yeah. Yes. So they had yeah. the lesbian kiss episode, mm-hmm. the first known lesbian kiss episode. That I actually remember. You know, the thing about the protecting the gay character, like that was like true because I clearly remember in... The Golden Girls, when Dorothy's friend from high school, from college, yes. with college, yep. was gay and she comes to visit and everyone thought that her partner who passed away, who was Pat, was a man. Right, right. And then, you know, she's afraid to let everyone know because she doesn't think that they're going to handle it and like everyone's fine with it. And then when Blanche's brother was gay, that was another yeah. character on that show. And they brought him back quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a little more recurring. I mean, even back into the 70s with uh, All in the Family, everyone always accepted them. Like there wasn't like a problem, like they weren't rejected when it finally came out. So I did notice that, that there was that trend of making it like, okay, like no one, even like even on a on the Golden Girls when Blanche originally didn't accept it, at the end, she saw yeah. how much of a relationship and how much it meant to her brother to have his boyfriend with them and show everyone that their love for each other. And, yep. uh, and then she even accepted it. So that was true. It was kind of nice to see that. One of the things I noticed in looking at some of the lists that I looked at is it seemed that most of the gay characters, and I don't think this list was completely comprehensive, but by far it seemed that most of the gay characters were men as opposed mm-hmm. to yeah. being more evenly men and women. And I hadn't thought about uh, in the eighties in particular, how maybe perhaps the AIDS crisis might have pushed it in that direction. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe it's because most of the, the writers were men. And so they were, <laughs> <Right>. Yeah, <exactly. laughs> that's, that's what they thought about. One of the things that I went back to, and I think this is going a little bit further back from the eighties, but do you remember Jamie Farr and Nash? Oh, yes, of course. Oh, yeah. Yes. Nobody ever commented on that. Like, no one in my family ever went, like, look at the queer in the dress. Or, I mean, it was <laughs> but he like, wasn't gay, though. He wasn't gay. Right. It's just a cross touch. He yeah. wanted to get discharged right. from the Right. But yeah, it was just like, you know, quality comedy that, you know, with in that respect, there was a purpose, mm-hmm. you know. But yeah, like, there was, I noticed, you know, of course, there was so much like, mislabeling you know back that i mean even in friends like when they started with chandler's dad Ex you know dad yes yes yeah but i read that i read the whole um article by Mar- i think it was marta kaufman that wrote like an op-ed 
about, mm. you know, how irresponsible it was back then. It just wasn't on anybody's radar. You know, they were going for the jokes and they had no reference, you know, no reference points to it. And then they get like a big name like Kathleen Turner to come in and, and play the part or whatever. But like, I felt like it, she was genuinely remorseful for not, you know, doing a little research and, you know, and again, I think it's more in the spotlight now, you know, people care more about their identities and how they're identifying or maybe less. <laughs> yeah, <I don't> know. <laughs> and she's right. It wasn't on anyone's radar and nobody was doing it purposefully to hurt our community in any way. It, you know, so to me, the fact that they went and now educated themselves, learned a lot from it, and then kind of integrated isn't, and correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't she one of the uh, executive producers of Grace and Frankie? Grace and Frankie, yes. She is one of the creators, Marta Kaufman. You take everything you learn from a community that just, that just like, you know, pointed a finger in your face and went, oh, <laughs> you didn't do everything right. You didn't do anything right. You know, and then you, and you, you know, you learn from it and you grow. But I think I do recall too that she made um, massive donations to a lot of different, like the HRC and, and mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. places where we need the help. Well, and I think intention is really important. But before we keep going, because I'd like to introduce you guys to our listeners. <laughs> um, so, because uh, we dived right in, which yes, is very exciting. Yeah, right. We're both <laughs> ready to go. Um, but Denise, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, kind of where you come from, where you are now, and a little bit about Rainbow Remix? Well, I am Denise. I'm a big out lesbian <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I've been doing podcasts since 2006. Started doing them out of a little guest room in my tiny condo and turned it into a studio when I realized that we were on to something. And they've always been, you know, very queer centric, LGBT community driven. And, you know, the sole goal was always and probably will always be to shine a, a spotlight on LGBT uh, creatives, you know, people that are creating content, whether it's Books, shorts, films, concerts, music, whatever they're doing, we know how difficult it is to get some traction, to get some eyes on your project. So that was always the goal from the beginning and always to have it be like a conversation. And that's how it began. And everything was self-taught then, you know, I mean, we had a great mentor and a guy that owned pretty much an all gay male website um, that took us under his wing when he knew what we were trying to do. And he thought, you know, I want to reach some women too, you know, not just make it about the men. And he gave us a platform, but he also taught us everything, you know, the technology. Uh, he was in, he was based in Atlanta and he literally flew, <laughs> flew down and um, met us and, you know, uh, gave us some contracts to sign, told us what his vision was. We were all on board. And the next time, he came was a couple of weeks later and he drove down from Georgia with his SUV full of equipment, you know, consoles, microphones, set up my whole guest room, like a little studio. And he, he was the one who like really held my producer's hand, who was a teacher. And we were doing it live at the time. We were going out live at a certain time. And then we, we decided to make podcasts so we could edit out some burps and uh <laughs> <laughs> what what are you talking about <laughs> nobody does that <laughs> you know, we had, yeah and then after a while we were just like you know like screw it man like don't even edit it out like we're real like we would eat on the show we would drink you could hear our ice clinking you can hear us burp we would fall off chairs we would <laughs> you know get a little inebriated from time to time but it was always a good time and you know i feel like we did so much good with that Ran for like 10 years. This is the Lesbian Lounge. Yeah. Yeah. Because I heard of that show. I, I remember hearing about that show. Yeah. It was a weird phenomenon that kind of took shape in like 2008, 2009. We were kind of doing all that, trying to do live events too. And it, it was fun. It was really fun. And then my uh, co-host got her like dream job. Like she always wanted to work for the LGBTQ community. And she finally got a job you know, and, uh, and it was, it was doing just that. So we had to, you know, kind of bring it to a close. And then for a while I was producing other 
podcasts. I sat on a, a panel for podcasting at uh, Clexicon and then JD called and it was like, you want to do this all over again? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, you know, we found our footing. It took us a little while. Like we started, we were trying to think of things that we had in common to do a podcast about. And we went right to whiskey and music. Right? Whiskey and music. Can't go wrong there. Both of us realized that LGBTQ projects just get so neglected. Mm-hmm. You know, they, uh, they have a really hard time, especially filmmakers, you know, to raise funds, you know, with their GoFundMes and their Seed and Sparks and all the Indiegogo things. And I've seen my friends have crushing failures, but I've also seen them have like some supreme success, you know, and I just want to be able, you know, to have people have a little taste of that kind of success, whether it's like new, you know, somebody new following their project or a decent donation or, you know, just give them a sh- the shout out that they deserve. So we both kind of agreed maybe that was the way to go mm-hmm. with the Rainbow Remix. I love that. I really do. And JD, tell us your story. Basically, my role in the entertainment world has been being a musician, a songwriter, and um, having my own band and also writing my original music. But I also had an internet radio show. I guess it's before they called them podcasts called That's Life. And I had like two people that would, we did it in a studio down here in Lake Worth. And uh, every week it would be my co-host, uh, which was my niece. She's a journalist. And we had a chat room. So we had people that would come in the chat room, kind of like you did with the lesbian lounge. And so I would read what the people were asking. So they weren't really calling in. But anyway, I got a taste of that, doing that. So um, when COVID hit and it was just sitting around with not much to do as a performer, I did go online a couple of times and I did some shows out of my studio in my house. And I couldn't believe in like, you know, the first time I did it in an hour, I was getting people from all over the world, literally. And there were like 270 people the first time I went live to do it. And I'm like, this is a great way to reach people. So why not do a podcast? And that's when I got in touch with Denise. And because I was getting people saying hello from Spain, hello from the UK, you know, it was crazy that it was the first time I did it. And I had done some touring, performing for the troops. I did some homeland tours and I got to go to Guantanamo Bay with my band. And wow. Yeah. So I was like, it was nice to be able to even reach some of those people because of my being on online the way the world is now was when I toured, it was before we even had GPSs in the cars. So it was early 2000s. You had to have a map. You had to get out that map. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it sounds like it was so far away, but it was like 2007 or something. You know, it wasn't that far away, but mm-hmm. you know, just getting that stuff. So, um, yeah, so I think, so this has been really great fun. I mean, when I first did my first radio show, it was really therapy for me when I was coming out of a divorce. So I was a late bloomer coming out as lesbian. I was married for 25 years to a man, but you know. <laughs> they knew, they knew they were waiting for me to tell them. <laughs> there was an exclusive for us. <laughs> I know they always said, when you finally come out, you have to do it on our show because I was denying, 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 you know, but, <laughs> um, but yeah. So I ended up having this whole big thing. I won't go into the story, but I was actually cheated on. And that's what ended my marriage, which was probably best that it all happened. But for my therapy, I started doing a show every Tuesday night. So yeah, so that's kind of like how I delved a little bit into this world. And I'm enjoying doing what we do every week. I think it's a lot of fun. Right, Denise? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a way to get through COVID. You know, I've always found it kind of a really great tool, a really great escape and a, uh, uh, to be artistic, another avenue. Yeah, I love that. And it's true. Like, I think Sharon and I are is sort of enjoying the process a lot more than we thought we would. Not that I didn't think I'd enjoy it, but it really is something that I miss. I get tired. We we don't do every week. We do every other week because we're not hardcore. But, you know, at, at the same time, I'm really excited to keep doing it. I'm like, oh, we can do this, you know, forever. Sorry. It's never. Sorry, Sherry. It's forever now. <laughs> no, it's, like, it's such a great 
niche topic that you guys have tapped into oh, yeah. that you're running. Like it is, it is never ending. You can just go and go and you're getting such great people. Uh huh. We have been very blessed. I'm thrilled with our guests too, which are both stars and TV creators and stuff, but we're also sort of expanding. Yeah. Uh huh. So I'm curious for you guys, what ladies driven 80s TV shows did you watch and love? And what does representation mean to you now? And what did it mean to you either before you came out or for coming out? I, I, I'll just go. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's I, a huge question. So like 50 yeah, questions, but go. Right. <laughs> When I was doing the deep dive and I was, you know, reading through and they just give you like a little clip of like what the episode was and the character and who played it and blah, blah, blah. And uh, I was reading up on the one, the LA law one that had the first lesbian kiss in it. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I remember that. And I was young. I was probably like maybe 12 or 13. And Ooh. I remember thinking, Ooh, <laughs> yeah. this might be what. Like all of a sudden, like the connectors were connecting. And, Look. you know, when I was younger, I was like a diehard Charlie's Angels fan. I mean, die hard. And, you know, it's funny, like, especially when you've come out late in life and you go back and you, and, and it's like in hindsight, you know, like yeah. my family would say, in hindsight, I should have known by the way you were, right. you know, in front of the TV watching Charlie's Angels drooling, you know, or, um, you know, that you had a Pat Benatar poster on your wall and most people had you know, like other people. So, you know, there were a lot of little tips that people just didn't pick up on along the way. Um, but I do remember like all of a sudden I was making that connection to why I love Charlie's Angels as much as I did to that LA law, like seeing two women kiss on TV for the first time. And then all the Cagney and Lacey that came into it too. Like, I was such, you know, again, like a diehard Cagney and Lacey fan that my birthday cakes were decorated with the <laughs> Cagney and Lacey logo with the blue Cagney and Lacey and the little television brown frosting, you know, like, it was like <laughs> insane. Everybody knew. And it was just like all those things were like, you know, making these connections in my mind to think maybe that's how you are, <laughs> you know, and then. Now, when I see it, I feel so much more relaxed, you know, or the little kids, you know, that are watching something, you know, that can say, hey, that's like me, because there's so many me's out there now, you know, there you've got like, you know, non-gender conforming, non-binary, and you've got transgender, and you've just got queer, you've got bisexual, and there's a little bit of that in just about everything Nowadays, not enough of it. Don't get me wrong, but there's a little bit. And I think that even I think, Jay, when we had um, Katrina on, who is a youth services worker from Liverpool here uh, uh -huh. that deals a lot with LGBTQ kids. And one of those things I think we were talking about was it how important it is to see things like that on TV or on um in yeah. your real life, like, are your are your parents hiding it from you? Are they, you know, are they shielding you from a gay cousin? Are they right. saying derogatory things? And, you know, like, to be able to see it represented on TV means so much to a little mind, to a young That's mind. True. It doesn't mean they're going to be that way. Right. You know, you know, it doesn't mean that that influence all of a sudden they're going to become queer. It just, you know, it just, if you already are having those feelings and you see right. it, you won't think they're wrong. Right, right. And you know what? That makes me think of um, the show Family with Buddy and Christy McNichol. And, and she was so clearly the tomboy. And I think that that was someone thinking back that I could relate to because she'd had the boyfriend. She dated Willie Ames, was her boyfriend, right? And so, you know, for someone like me growing up in, in and also growing up in the 70s, you figure that's just what you do. That's what you did. I, I don't know if I'm saying that right. I'm just saying like they took a character who was kind of a tomboy, but made her still have a boyfriend and be, you know, living like, like a straight kid where nowadays I think it would hopefully would be different or they would show you that she's more of, uh, you know, yeah, I think I used to confuse myself. Like, do I want to be like them or am I like them? Mm -hmm. Right. 
Like, right. do I want to dress like them? Do I want to be like them? Like, that's where my confusion yeah. came. Because I worked at Christy McNichol haircut until I was like, yeah, <laughs> I think I yeah. it in my graduation picture. I still <laughs> wasn't like that. But I mean, those were the, yeah, those were the things that you connected with, you know, like the look of somebody that wasn't wearing a dress or that wasn't wearing like a print shirt or, you know, that had bows in their hair or wearing high heels or something like right. those were the, the things I was connecting with in characters, but I hadn't put that all together. Right. Because you then know, she was put in the box of like normal, you know, like she was yeah. put in that box of she had a boyfriend and not a girlfriend or whatever. I, I hope yeah. I'm saying that. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's true. It's like, yes. I mean, even just having a tomboy character felt groundbreaking in the 70s and 80s and i'm right. thinking of joe from facts of life right as well in that in that category you couldn't go any further than that i think right. even for you know for me as a tomboy yeah right. that you know not gay but could have been certainly there was a tomboy element so there's there's both the tomboy and then there's also the gay tomboy. <laughs> right? right. Exactly. And we no, know you, you never got the gay tomboy in 70s or 80s television. You just exactly. got up to tomboy. <laughs> uh, and, um, yeah. but those characters clearly resonated with girls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As well as I think some guys, right? We're like, Joe's my favorite, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And Darlene on, uh, on, on, um, uh, Roseanne. 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 Looking yeah. back, it's like, how could anybody believe that she was with David? Like, <laughs> you know, like, how did anyone buy that? Right? I don't know. Yeah, but you know, I, as someone who was not a regular Roseanne watcher, I, I don't know. I think that you can look at it both ways. I had no problem believing that Darlene and David were a couple mm -hmm. that she was straight, but you could certainly read it a, a totally different yeah, way as well. Yeah, equated her. More with just like a like a moody, miserable teenager. Yeah, you know, yeah like pretty that, much. Yeah, like everybody went, went to that <laughs> angsty period. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, and this is so funny. Like I was trying to think of how I how I would spend um a day off from school, like a snow day or a sick day or whatever. And all that was on television during the day were daytime talk shows, like. Sally Jesse Raphael and oh, yeah, Phil Donahue. And See, because I was thinking soap operas, but forgetting that you are younger than I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> when that probably was not. No, 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 yeah, not definitely. Because when, when that was happening, staying home from school or whatever, it was soap operas that were on. This was in the, or game shows. It was, the, it predated oh, yeah. the game rise shows. of all of the daytime talk shows for me. Yeah. So, totally. So, anyway, yeah. sorry. But I would always get like sucked in to like a daytime talk show that would have something on about like a wife that was leaving her husband because the hus she found out the husband was gay or something. I'd be like, <laughs> you know, like really, you know, like there's that word again, because I think, you know, I grew up in Niagara Falls in New York, you know, on, on the American side, but right, right there, you know, could pretty much walk to Canada, you know, no big deal. <laughs> but um, it was, uh, it was a town where, you know, like even now when I go back, like I can look at women that are wearing jeans and that play in a softball league and, you know, got their hair in a, in a pony wearing flannel shirts, you know, and I'm like, they could be gay. They look like they could be. And it, yet they're not. <laughs> so it was so uh, weird, you know, for me, uh, you know, is that there was no gay bars. There were no, there wasn't a lot of talk of it. I had one cousin, my mother's he was like my godfather actually. And he lived in Las Vegas. He was a hairdresser and he, he was Lola Falana's hairdresser, not Ooh. just any hairdresser. Wow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he moved and he moved back home and he and a friend of his opened up a hair salon. And um, the thing I loved about him was that like, he was not flamboyant at all. I mean, a little bit, you know, he had the lisp or whatever. Like, I mean, you knew, but um, nobody made a big deal out of it in my family, you know, yeah, and, then, I and then, you know, like, right. Like nobody made a big deal out of it. it was, he was just, he was just pet, you know, like he, he, go get your hair cut, you know, like <laughs> that's coming to the house, go wash your hair. He's going to cut your hair. That kind of thing it was nothing major. And then 
as I got a little bit older, I had another cousin who came out and she's a lesbian, really successful chiropractor, like massive business, like very well known and well respected in the community. So I guess like I didn't see a lot of it growing up yet. What I did see was completely normal, but I was still too young to like ask questions about it or whatever. So everything I was getting was from TV. Right. You know, I, I didn't want to just like, you know, bombard my cousins with all kinds of questions and then have them go, well, do you think you are? And then have to answer that. So, you know, it was more like, I just want to see someone like me on television. Like that, that's, that's, you know, it's what I want to see. And there was so little of it. It was really, really difficult. You know, the older I got, I guess, the busier you get, you know, and then you're not thinking about those things. Mm -hmm. Like nothing in Friends ever offended me, you know, about that. Even, even now I look back and I go, man, it's like, I don't know. I just, I did, I wasn't offended by it, but then again, I'm not transgendered or I'm not, you know. Well, so, but in, let's talk about Friends. Mm -hmm. I remember the lesbian couple getting married right mm-hmm. from Chandler, yes. like uh, not Chandler, uh uh ross, ross's, ross's ex ross's right? ex yeah that was pretty huge mm. For, like i don't remember there being a lesbian wedding on screen there might have been i don't i can't or was oh. that the first lesbian wedding in a like primetime tv could, show could very well i feel like it might have been i feel almost, like it might have been almost has to be and it was treated so well, I mean, the yeah. whole idea of it. I like think. Ross was disappointed and right. Ross was annoyed and it was played for comedy. But at the same time, their relationship and her lesbianism was not made fun of. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, it was so accepted by all of them. Like, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Like, we, everybody always goes, oh, I hated Ross. You're like, my <laughs> wife was, I hated Ross. And I'm like, I know why. I know why. Because we all know a guy like Ross. <laughs> <laughs> so off putting, I get it. But in that instant, like, didn't he step up and end up walking? Yes, yes, down the aisle, or yeah. one of them down the aisle, and the parent didn't show up. So, yeah, like I thought, you know, he had a few redeeming qualities where he could have really, you know, been a jerk. He wasn't. Like I was a lot older, watching Friends and thinking, "Yay them for doing it!" Like that was the feeling. And anytime. I would see something after that, you know, and that was why like in the nineties and then going into 2000 and those characters started becoming more prevalent, you know, like a Jack McFarland and, you know, that kind of, I was just Will and Grace in general, you know, I was just like, Oh my God, thank God, you know, we're finally getting there. Cause it felt like it was really bad towards the end of the eighties and the very beginning of the nineties, you know, like where it took like a lot of guts, I think. And I, I hate to say it, but I think there was a lot of, network executives, you know, that were protecting their advertising dollars. Right. You know, and they were not going to step on anything, any landmines whatsoever. And that was, you know, the the feeling for the longest time, you know, and, he, and even now I, I watch things. So, yeah, I think we've got such a long way to go, but I see it more and I do credit streamers, you know, original content on streamers seem to have less restrictions, Mm -hmm. you know, and I always think to myself, good, because I'm paying a membership fee for these things, you know, whereas I could disconnect from regular cable Mm -hmm. and not care about what they're doing on ABC and NBC uh, and all that stuff, uh, you know, anymore, because I'll find what I'm looking for on streamers now, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to give my money for that. Okay, this is probably a good time to take a break, but we'll be back with more. Hey, movie lovers, it's Jackson here from the Back to the Blockbuster podcast. If you've ever wanted to hear an amateur cinephile and an industry professional chat about film and television, then look no further, because every week, my co-host Gaius and I, we bring you the latest industry news, break down the most recent trailers, try to beat the box office with our weekly predictions, and dive into our favorite movies on their anniversaries. And every second Friday, you can look forward to the Back to the Blockbuster spinoff, Deep Dives with Owen and Gaius, where the duo dissects a movie of their own choice. All this and more wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to the Xfinity 10G network, my little brother's friends won't leave our house. When I was their age, internet with basically no interruptions was a pipe dream. You sound like my grandpa. Restrictions apply. Not available in all areas. Welcome back. If you don't want to listen to those ads anymore, go on over to patreon.com slash 80s TV ladies and you can get them ad free. Anyway, where were we? 
So I just wanted to bring this article that when I was doing a little bit of research, that's from uh, February 2022, NBC News. For the first time that season, lesbians outnumber gay men among broadcast television LGBTQ characters, according to a report released from GLAAD, which I thought was interesting given how little lesbian representation there was in the 70s and 80s. Right. And then all of a sudden, and then yeah. moving I mean, towards- come on, we're more likable. <laughs> <laughs> and according, according to Wikipedia, Carol and Susan's ceremony was the first lesbian oh. wedding on okay. network television See? or on television huh? in the U.S. So which makes sense. I, I couldn't have I couldn't think of anybody else. One of the things we're doing is we're looking back from a modern lens on these elements right. in the 80s and in this episode 90s and beyond mm-hmm. because you know, of what we got right and what we got wrong. Uh And so you can argue that Friends kind of got the lesbian character right. Exactly. And I think being able to say, yeah, we got it wrong is a really big step. Right. And I felt like it was genuine. Like I didn't feel like it was lip service in a programmed kind of press release. Mm -hmm. I was actually really impressed with with what she had to say and what she learned from it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Because those are the people that are still making things today, you know, and they're the ones that, I mean, that's a huge lesson when society is pushing back at you to to be canceled because of your mistakes in the 80s, you know, to to, to come forward and say, yeah, we, we, we did get that horrifically wrong. wrong. We apologize. You know, we didn't know what we were doing then. Here's some money. (laughs) Here's the money. And these are my newest shows. I'm trying to get things right, you know, and I think that's how it's going to be done. We have a friend, uh, Jay, Jill Bennett, right? Mm -hmm. She has made two quality sitcoms that you will never see. Mm. They just can't get the funding and they can't get eyes on them. They can't get them to the right people. And they are, it's just quality work. And it's so heartbreaking that they're doing like contests and fundraising and all this stuff. And it's all for what, you know what I mean? Like there's always going to be some executive that's not quite comfortable making that decision or, you know, pre lighting that project for whatever reasons. And that's what they're up against all the time. And it, it, you know, when you see that kind of talent getting wasted working in a day job that they're so unhappy doing to pay the bills when they've got this project sitting on a shelf, it's just gut wrenching, you know? And, and is this Jill, B- what are the films? And then came Lola? The show was called Second Shot. Okay. Great. It was about an ex famous uh, soccer star that has to come home and work again because Soccer never really took <laughs> off, right? Yeah. And all the characters in it were great. And it had like that cheers vibe feel to it, you know, but all made and written by lesbians and the funding was raised by them and everything. And it was like a, a really quick, like blink if you miss it kind of thing, like on Vimeo or something like that. We had Haviland Stillwell on the show who was working with Jill on this called Bad Habits about two women have to pretend to be nuns for obvious reasons. And they're both like, you know, criminals, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but the concept and everything was great. And there's absolutely no reason that these things aren't on TV, you know, and that's what like a podcast like ours is trying to do is to get people interested and get them talking and get them pushing and pushing for it. You know, that's the only way that these things are going to get done. Mm-hmm. I think when you say about that a lot of the characters that were gay characters on the earlier sitcoms and in the 80s and the 70s, they were mostly men. That is really true. And I think that even like when Queer as Folk came out, you know, there was one lesbian couple and all of these guys and they you didn't even see them with once in a couple of episodes, you would see them with friends. But, you know, they're women, they're gay friends. But Mostly, and it was, so it was really hard within, as a person who was, you know, closeted, but wanted to see that on TV, I didn't really see the women. 
except for when L Word came out, obviously. But, you know, like Queer as Folk, it was just always men. And it was just really, I don't know why that was. I, I always wondered why don't the women get the representation, even with that, that the men got. I guess it's kind of consistent across television. <laughs> <so>. Exactly. <laughs> And yet there's an audience. There's an audience. If podcasting has taught us anything, it's yeah, that there's exactly. an audience for everything. Yeah, and, and I think that's the same that is being found in streaming and that in some ways it is the perfect place to speak to a particular audience. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It always amazes me. Doesn't it amaze you, Jay? Like when you have how many straight people come over to tell you that they watched the L word or they watched something, you know, like, like, uh, well, what did Judy and, uh, her husband come over and watch with you? Oh, we watched, um, Tammy and George. Oh, never mind. That was straight. <laughs> 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 but I used to, I would remember like when I had a day job and I would come into work and, and I, there were so many straight people that we'd sit around at lunchtime and talk about, you know, the L word. Oh, and yeah. they would all have like straight crushes on Shane and Jennifer Beals and, you know, like, and it was so, they were so open about talking about it, you know, like it was no big deal. And I always thought to myself, sure, I thought it was only lesbians watching it, but it's not, you know, it's lesbians and straight men. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, um, but yeah, no, I do think that there, you know, there, there is an audience for, for that kind of thing. I was really sad when the new queers folk didn't get, a second chance. They only got one season, but I do think they were trying to tick too many boxes off. You know, like you hate when someone has to scrap a dream or put their passion aside and try something else, mm -hmm. you know, and I have a lot of friends that are doing that now. And it's like, if they could just go down the street that they're supposed to be on, you know, we would all get access to that kind of like good quality programming and witty writing and, and sharp you know, good laughs, like, you know, like nothing offensive to us, you know, but um, again, I always feel like it comes down to some, you know, rich, conservative, white male saying no, you know, and it's really. It's hard not to recognize that the gatekeepers say, I don't know, the head of NBC. <laughs> yeah. Right. Who got uh, kicked out because of inappropriate relationships with a uh, female employee, <laughs> employee of the company of the company. So like, you're like when the gatekeeper is that right, they're not interested in true female representation. Nope. They're not interested in something that isn't hot to them. Right. Right. And yep. that is not about money. That is not about advertisers. That is about being at the whim of a uh, man's opinion. Yeah. Power. Which I'm Power. not Power. excited Power. to be <laughs> at anymore. <laughs> Speaking of that, let's talk about Ellen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, God. Uh, and the puppy episode. I can remember vividly sitting there watching that on my green leather couch. <laughs> and you knew it was coming. We knew it was coming, right? It had been teased it was that it was coming. Yeah. And I'll tell you, you know, like I remember watching when Rosie O'Donnell had a talk show. Yeah, right? yeah. You know, she had Ellen on, and they were discussing how they were both Lebanese. Yes, <laughs> just saw it was that. A great, it was a great way of getting around it. You know, it was like fantastic. She was, I think, maybe I Lebanese too. <laughs> so, for our listeners that don't remember or weren't around, Ellen was a TV show starring Ellen DeGeneres. It actually started as a different title, and these first friends season. of mine, I these believe, friends, of, friends mine. of mine, yes. and it was more ensemble. No. And then Ellen was the breakout star of that. So the second season, it came back basically as Ellen. And Ellen ran a bookstore and had a bunch of crazy friends. When it started out, it wasn't supposed to be about what it ended up being, right? Yeah, the right. Ellen show. It I was mean, just it was a character comedy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that became very successful. I think ABC was trying to create their version of Friends, perhaps. Yes. The yeah, very right? the opening of the first season is very much, oh, we're trying to do Friends. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little blatant. Yeah. yeah. Little, I think obvious. they're holding umbrellas in the opening. <laughs> a group of friends. They could get away with that, but they can't say, like, pissed. <laughs> Oh, God. And then Ellen DeGeneres was a known comic when that went on and a lesbian, a known lesbian in the entertainment industry. 
I don't know if it was known out. Okay. So I went to high school with the Indigo Girls, Amy and Lily. Oh. So, you know, anyway, I was at a concert after a show of theirs out here. And a friend of mine who was gay was like, oh, we have to go to the after party. And again, I'm not quite cool enough to be fully gay. So I, but I got to, I got to, I get a pass every once in a while to go to the after party. And so <laughs> I got to go and it was at, Ellen DeGeneres' apartment. Oh, my God. God. And so, but before Ellen was on the air, it was just, I think they had shot it, but it hadn't Uh, aired. But my friend was like, that's Ellen DeGeneres. She's in the kitchen. We got to go say hello. So we went to say hello to Ellen DeGeneres before, and I, that was the first time I had met her. So I guess in that moment, I'm like, everyone else in this room is lesbian. <laughs> I am officially at a lesbian party. I am officially at a lesbian party because Indigo Girls, Amy and Emily, <laughs> my friend, yeah. and Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> this is a lesbian party. And, you know, all women. So I guess in my mind, I was just like, oh, she's a known lesbian comic who wasn't out the way you might be out now. Right. But certainly wasn't hiding it. Right. And yet it took many years. And so there was a moment season five where were we i think so yeah where they go to the network and they're like we're going to we need to make a shift for the character R- ratings are dropping we need to do something and ellen herself the star of the show wants to stop coding everything yeah i mean yeah. i think it was everybody on the show agreed it's time yeah let's just make this happen and apparently at the network they were like well You know, if you want her to have a life change, maybe she can get a puppy. Mm. That's how this episode became known as the puppy episode. I never knew that was why it was called. I didn't know that. A network executive suggested that instead of coming out as gay, maybe the Ellen character could get a puppy. My (laughs) blow. Wow. But leading up to it, I do remember there was a lot of... Oh, a lot of hype. I mean, Melissa Etheridge had signed on... Laura Dern was was oh, right. be yes. the object of interest, right? Oprah, Oprah, Oprah's <laughs> in the episode. Oh, that's right, yes. playing yeah. Ellen's therapist. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the buildup was just incredible. I feel like every lesbian was just like this, <laughs> you know, like game time. And you know, and in my opinion, I thought the episode was so well done. You know, I mean, it was. It was comedy, you know, saying it into the speaker at the, at the airport, you know, it was, it was absolutely perfect. And to know how it imploded everything from the show to our life to even Oprah talking about it, you know, recently about how much hate that she got for being on the episode and Laura Dern saying the same thing. Like, I don't know that any of us knew how deep it went. It wasn't just that the show got canceled. It was the horrific hatefulness that came, you know, afterwards that that almost like sank her entire career. She was like, she sacrificed it for the show, like sacrificed herself for the show, thinking it was going to be this, you know, great idea. And I don't think our country was ready for it or certainly that network wasn't ready for it, even though they invested so much, you know, into it, obviously to get these people. I didn't Melissa Ethers like sign over a toaster. So, so send a toaster or something to her, but like they just had all these great little nuances that they put into it. So it seemed like so much work went into it only for it to just backfire so spectacularly. Yeah. I mean, it was- really lost everything for a while. Like people didn't know if she was going to be coming back. I remember when that book came out, which she um, was doing a tour with, she wrote her book. She had an interview with Barbara Walters after she lost the show and everything about how she lost everything. And I wrote a song called Come Out and Dance, just watching that episode. The whole thing was, the whole song was coming to me. And I tried so hard to get that song to her. And I just never could get it to her. But I, I even gave a copy to her mom when I bought the book and her mom, I'm like, could you please give this to Ellen? <laughs> number, <laughs> 10, number 10 is for her. And I never did get it to her, but it just always really, 
it really, that hurt to see that happen to someone who had built so much and was so loved by fans and to have everything turn against her. Yeah. It felt personal. Like not, not even yeah. a joke. It felt personal. Like all of a sudden it felt really, really personal, like how awful it was. And I, and I think it's something that's, it's a reminder, you know, it's a reminder that, you know, just when you think you're on to something really good and everything is, is copacetic and you're being accepted and, you know, there's a lot of gay stuff on TV now and there's a lot of lesbians out in the forefront and blah, blah, blah. It's like PTSD. Like there's still this thought that it could all be taken away. Then you have this stuff that's actually happening in the country. So it's not so far fetched, you know? Years later, did it happen that she got her talk show and then did so amazingly well with it? Was there a lot of time between that? I don't remember. I now. think that took. She right. had a, she had a one season or even half a season of the Ellen Show a year or two after, and then I think it was a couple of years. It was interesting because it's also what you're saying. A little bit of hate and vitriol is very powerful. Yeah. When it's coming at you, yeah, right, because it's not a little bit, right? Like when I say a little bit, but the number of people who were like great or fine, whatever, much higher than the number of people who are hateful about what happened. But you're going to hear from them. They were louder. They're, yep. You're yeah. going to hear from them, and they're going to be so hateful that they're going to write racist, hateful letters to Oprah. Yeah, <laughs> for yeah. being in a scene. Of that yeah. show. I mean, think of how much you have to care. <laughs> <laughs> I know. About something that if you don't like, you could just not have watched. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> By the way, I Ellen's seriously haven't picked up a pen or a pencil <laughs> unless I'm writing my wife a note like, don't forget lettuce, you know, or something <laughs> like that. I mean, like, I can't imagine. And even on Twitter, I mean, like you only get 140 characters. How much crap can you spill? You know, but yeah, there are people out there that it's not about 140 characters. It's how many times a day we're using those 140 characters and spinning it out. You know, like it's, it's awful. It's such a, it's such a cesspool Twitter, but, um, that's just it is that the louder right. ones are the ones that get the fop. And, and again, we're seeing it right now. Like there's a absolutely huge backlash to all these advances that have been made for LGBTQ equality. Yeah. And it is horrific and terrifying. It is designed to hurt people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is designed to wreak havoc on people's lives. Yeah. And it is personal. Literally. It really is. It really is. You know, the thing is, like, I, I was just thinking about this today. Like, sometimes I feel like all that hate that's out there, right, in laws and legislation that's trying to get pushed through and, and all that kind of stuff, that's, that's over here, you know, and then you have the abortion stuff, and that's over here on this side, and that's huge and overwhelming. And I'm watching Grey's Anatomy, and I see that their storyline is about abortions mm -hmm. and the hate that's going at abortion clinics and all of a sudden you're like, I don't even think there's enough television to spotlight all the things. <laughs> there's so many things. Like, oh my God. Wow. You know, like it's just, it just, it's, it's mind blowing. But I think the thing of it is, is to me, when I see something on TV, it gets my attention. You know, when I see something on social media, I'll just scroll past it. Right, right. You no, know? and unless unless it's something that's like positive, like donate to this cause or whatever, <laughs> make a donation. Whereas if I see something on TV, it totally garners my attention. You know, like one hundred percent of it. I don't know if that's like shallow or wrong or. <laughs> well, no, that's the visceral. Like, like that is the power and impact of television. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And particularly for those of us who grew up with it as our internet, right? Our like with our, yeah. our source of information, right? Yeah. And that's just it. I mean, those were the things that helped me figure out what was going on in me. 
you know, because I didn't have any other references, you know, I didn't have any resources. So that was the things that helped me until I could, until I was old enough, you know, to see a therapist and say, this is what's going on. It's been going on since this. And, you know, these are the things that I figured out. And does this make me a lesbian? And she went, mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> now we just have to tell your husband. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, it was, it was a lot. Quite a great thing for you to do, you know, thinking as a person who was also married to a man for many years, I, more years than you are. That was a brave thing for you to recognize that in yourself and actually go do something about it. It's just weird when you're sitting there, you know, purging your guts to somebody. I can vividly recall, I, it was just like so many times saying, and then I saw Christy McNichol and then I saw Joe on back. <laughs> And then there, you know, and then I, and then there was like this Cagney obsession. And then there was like, it was just like so many things that, you know, like all of a sudden everything was going back to TV. And I think that was another, if it wasn't for that, I don't know, would I have ever figured it out? I don't know. You know, like it's just, well, maybe because of the internet, but, you know, eventually the internet comes up into our lives. And that's the interesting thing because again, you and your wife met with you doing a podcast. Yeah. Yes. And her reaching out to you. I mean, yeah. think about like, again, an element of media that did not exist when we were growing up. Right. Radio did, but you wouldn't have had a radio show about lesbians in the time of <laughs> oh, just God, radio. No, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, it's so strange. And do you remember uh, when we had you on our show, we were talking about designing women. Mm hmm. And we were, I was saying how all along I thought Anthony was gay and then he wasn't. You pointed out the wedding and all that. There was an episode where a gay guy who was dying of AIDS wanted them to do his funeral. Yes. 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 Yeah. And that yeah. was that was a very that was an Emmy winning episode, a renowned episode, killing the right people, killing all it's the right, people. killing all the right people. Yeah. And it's a line that the creator writer heard. Right. In the hospital while her mother was dying of AIDS from a blood transfusion. Yep. And within a, less than a year, she wrote that episode after her mother had passed. And yeah. And that was, again, like uh, an Emmy winning episode. Mm-hmm. It was like, and that was, I think, I want to say like 86 or 87, maybe around then. Yeah. 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 And I think that it was starting to be a little bit more recognized how powerful, you know, that words were, you know, mm-hmm. whether they were about someone gay, whether they were uh, about someone with AIDS or whatever. And I, I just, I just remember, you know, reading that about that writer hearing that in a hospital and naming the episode, you know, yeah. that, and it was just like, man, you know, like what an impact again, what an impact. Yeah. October 7th, 1987, Season yeah. two, wow. episode four. Early. Yeah, early. early. Mm-hmm. Linda Bloodworth early. Tomlinson. And yeah. what an incredible, and again, very sophisticated in some ways, you know, because it's like, how am I going to work this into an episode? Oh, a, a guy's going to show up and say, design my funeral because I am dying. Yeah. And I want it to be a celebration and I want it to be reflective of who I am. Yeah, and and then, and there's a B story happening for Annie Potts' character. Yeah, about having condoms available and sex education available for their high school kids. Yeah, and it sort of combines and it says, "I don't want my kids to be facing a death sentence mm-hmm. for experimenting with sex. So can we just give them some condoms and tell them about <laughs> sex?" <laughs> and yeah, and like so controversial though for back so then. Both those, I'm like putting both of those in. You know, just very very controversial, but also imparting information that people across the country didn't have. And didn't have arguments against like, well, no, we shouldn't like, you know, it's like, you're going to tell kids about sex. You want them to have sex. It's like, no, <laughs> here's no. an argument <laughs> that just says, here's the reality. Kids are going to have sex yeah. and we right. should make sure that they have the information right. they need. Now you can yeah. deny yeah. that and people kind of thought they should be, but uh, yeah. I they forget it. 
Yeah. You know, like they get now, they think that everything that an LGBTQ person, everything about them is about grooming a child to be gay or grooming right. that for sex right. or, you know, right. they're, they're, something perverted about it. And that's what they're, they're pushing now. And it, it just has nothing to do with education, resources, information, truth, fact, you know, it, it never, it's just this weird thing that they have that they, associate it with that kind of pervertedness, you know, and it's so offensive, you know, as a, you know, well, as and, again, and as we find out from the people that are the loudest, it's often projection. It so is. And it is, I am inappropriate with my coworkers, my whatever, like the loudest people <laughs> right <laughs> now that are going after the groomers yeah, you have an awful lot of people who are inappropriate with children and teenagers in their yeah. ranks. And so yeah. it's a very weird way to, I think, throw up a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. But it's also it's also designed to be uh, right now. This is about I truly believe it's designed to be hurtful. There's not a lot of true believers. There's a lot of people performing and trying to to hurt people in order to distract them for whatever their other goal is. Yeah. I say there are, and then they're, they're, and they're bringing the true believers with them and giving them yeah. rage and vitriol and mm -hmm. guns. And um, yeah, it's really deeply upsetting right now how much things are worse in many ways than they were in the eighties, even as there's more visibility. But I think it's in some ways the fear of that visibility and the fear that, people will be allowed to sort of declare who they are and be who they are and have those freedoms of choice yeah. in both who they are and what they do with their body. Yeah. That is most fearful to the controlling factors of, but then you might not think the way I think or do what I want yeah. you to do. And right. I want to control so that. Yeah. It's just, yeah. And speaking of the eighties, it's like, Think about who we were most entertained by, you know, um, television aside, right? Boy George, Prince, Grace Jones. You know what I mean? Like the weirdest people ever that were just entertaining us and nobody went, oh my God, you know, like who wants to look like that? No, we were dressing up like them for Halloween. <laughs> you know what I mean? I I mean I remember growing up. My mom loved Liberace. Oh yes. <laughs> and I was like, like I remember as a kid, you know, seeing Liberace. But I'm like, did people think? Did they know he was gay? Did did women not know that, or did they know it and they just didn't say it? Or I'm like, mom, did you know? Did anybody realize that he was gay? Like nobody really thought about it. Yeah, I don't know. It's I don't know. And Paul Lind, that was another <laughs> one. Oh yeah. Men, right he was so so like the center square every night Hollywood <laughs> square, like, like, you were so entertained by these people your whole <laughs> lives and now now you have a problem well and again i think i think for a lot of people it was well don't don't talk about it right you were fine unless you started declaring it mm -hmm. right? and yeah. owning it right yeah. and there's this part of me that wants to feel like people know the difference between right and wrong. That feeling that you get in your stomach mm -hmm. doing or saying something wrong, you know it, you know it, you know, why doesn't that feeling and that, why doesn't that matter anymore? You know, like all of a sudden it doesn't matter. I got to believe that there are more people that know right from wrong and feel it in their gut and do the right thing. But I'm telling you, I'm struggling. <laughs> I'm struggling. <laughs> yes. And a word I learned in the last month was stochastic terrorism. Nice. Stochastic means basically just scattershot. It's like a biology term, I believe. It's basically the use of mass public communication, usually against a particular individual or group, which incites or inspires acts of terrorism, which are statistically probable, but happen seemingly at random. So perpetuating that fear and that sort of rage. rage and the like, how dare you force me to feel uncomfortable? 
that that yeah. a feeling of uncomfortableness, yeah. right? Because I don't understand who you are or who you want to be, and that makes me uncomfortable. And that feeling gets turned into disgust and rage and anger, and incites violence, right? Yeah, through the Fox Newses and the you know dark media and yeah. things yep. and then it's like oh and then let's give everybody guns and you don't need a license for it it'll be fine <laughs> well, like, <laughs> what a solution we know that there are people purposely feeding oh yeah this rage yeah right because yep. it then creates people who respond because people like because somebody just loses their crap yeah and then they have been pointed to a target and that target is those people who are different from you and those people who are different from you and those women who want to have control over their bodies and those like, right. and it's really hard. Many people who are reasonable just hide. Like, I don't want to be around that. I don't want to, I don't, you don't want, want to argue I don't with want these, to argue people, right? with these mm -hmm. people. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. have somebody turn their anger on me. Right. Right. And so it's really hard to stand up and go, well, now hold on. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think it's hard for people to stay engaged in the process of defending our rights and our civil rights and our human rights. It's and, exhausting. And, and because yeah. it's exhausting. You feel like yeah, I do. Know. There's no way. Absolutely. And they're counting on that. So we have to keep getting the love and the support and staying prideful. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so, so, but do, so, so JD is, your, I know you're in Florida. Yes. Yes. A favorite state of the terrorists. <laughs> uh, what toxic, can we do? Toxic Florida. How can we help what's happening with Pride? I know you just had a Pride event that you played we at. We did. And uh, yeah, let's talk about that. I had uh, every intention of going to Pride, right? And then a couple of days before, I had a friend tell me, did you hear that DeSantis is whipping up protesters to come to Pride? You know, like nobody knows what's going to go down or you know, if, if, uh, how it's going to be. And so all of a sudden I was like, what? So I, I text Jay and I'm like, hmm, I'm feeling a little nervous about going to Pride <laughs> because I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to get my ass blown off for going to a Pride festival. And it, so I said, I'm going to do a little research or whatever. And I like scoured the internet and I could find nothing, nothing. But I, and I hadn't really heard of that. That, that. Right. So she was like, I don't know. I didn't hear anything about that. And she was like, but if you don't feel comfortable, by all means, like, I won't be upset. Don't, you know, don't, don't go. And I thought, you know, I sat back and I thought, like, this is so stupid. So I go back to the person that told me and I'm like, where did you hear this? Because I'm not yeah. finding anything about it. And it's really messing me up because I don't not want to go. Like, I want to go and I don't want to be fearful and I don't want to be nervous and anxious and so I think she was like, I think somebody in the office like mentioned it. And I'm like, so you're just repeating something without like somebody just said background or checking on it or anything, you know? So I just said, you know what? I, I've had it. I'm going. I'm yeah. going. That was really no went, there was absolutely not one protester there. It was a lovely day. At no point did I ever feel unsafe. So I was like, I was really relieved and happy that we went and Jay like knocked it out of the park. Thank you, you have to follow so many drag queens and the crowd is so oh, hyped. Yeah. The yeah. queen, right? Like the Taylor Dane queen was insane. She was so good. <laughs> I always had to share dressing rooms with the drag queens when I do pride events. It's so funny. Like I can't. I wonder if she's going to come out with like big hair. I was going to say, <laughs> their hair is all bigger than yours. I'm looking for the makeup tips from them. Like, what are you using? <laughs> What is that thing you got? How do you, how are you not sweating out here? Like to answer the question, like, I think we just have to keep on doing our thing, like showing up at pride, mm -hmm. not canceling things and, and just keeping on being who we are. Like sometimes it's daunting to think, what can you do except show up like we did? At yeah, pride. That's the, it's the smallest yeah. thing and yeah. yet it's, it's biggest, the biggest thing. Yeah. It's not nothing. Showing up support, is not nothing. You know, support other yeah. Like support the drag queens and support uh, your trans friends. And, you know, and, uh, you know, like you, you have to know that they're going through something that's just like horrific, you know, like knowing mm -hmm. that their healthcare and their, and their rights are being, you know, could be stripped away at any moment and are in other states or whatever. I mean, 
what you can do is just be there for them, be supportive for them, you know, find groups and organizations that are, you know, that need volunteers that need help. And that's, you know, that's the way to go. When Denise told me about the, this thing about maybe there was some problem with security or some protesters, I'm like, but I had bracelets made. I have a hundred. 50 rainbow remix bracelets. Yes. <laughs> not, not going. Yeah. She honored that commitment. She honored it hard, man. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So, uh, where can people find you? We've got a YouTube channel. Uh, they can just search the rainbow remix podcast. You can actually watch our shows. And then we're also on Podbean and, um, you can go to my lesbian radio feed there and all our shows are there we have a website it's the rainbow remix.com and rainbow remix is on instagram twitter facebook all the all the socials <laughs> fantastic we really appreciate you having us on today this is so much fun first of all just 80s television alone is the greatest topic ever but um, I think it's it's amazing that you're you know really spotlighting the uh, the lack of representation back then and 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 how things were were being done back then. Like it's just uh, something I don't think we think enough about, you know. And uh, when when we see where we're at now and we and we look back then, like I I know I learned a few things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. It's been delightful. Okay, you guys, take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 For our audiography today, you can find Rainbow Remix at therainbowremix.com. Check out their YouTube channel and their podcast on all your favorite players. You can also donate in support of LGBTQ youth at thetrevorproject.com. We hope 80s TV Ladies brings you joy and laughter and lots of fabulous new and old shows to watch, all of which will lead us forward toward being amazing ladies of the 21st century. 